Hi, everyone. I'm Lisa DeSaro, Executive Director of Marketing for Clarion Books. I am thrilled that joining me today to chat is author Rena Barron, author of Maya and the Rising Dark and Maya and the Return of the Godlings. Hi, Rena. Welcome. Hi. Thanks for having me, Lisa. Um, everyone at Clarion has been a big fan of Maya since before we were even able to acquire it. Um, and we're not alone. A starred review from SLJ called the first book a must read and a starred review from Kirkus called it a hashtag black girl magic, cloudy day, curl up kind of book. Um, people shouldn't let that curl up comment fool them though, because these are action packed adventures with a fierce yet relatable 12 year old girl at their core. Um, we're so glad that we get to follow Maya through not just one book, but three. Um, so I just wanted to start by asking you what led you to write Maya and the Rising Dark? And did you know when you started it that it was going to be for a middle grade audience? Yeah, um, I I definitely wanted to write this story because I didn't see a lot of books growing up when, when I was growing up that had Black protagonists as leads, particularly in fantasy, where they were just kind of living their lives and having fun and being the center of their own story and being a hero of the story. So I wanted to write a story that kind of just focuses uh, focused on you know this 12 year old black girl who's kind of a center of her you know her her story um and, and so i initially wanted to do the story in chicago in a neighborhood that i lived in um and it was a neighborhood that you know even to this day kind of only gets you know talked about and and not the best lights because some of the, the things that are going on um, and it's fair to talk about that stuff, but I think what was missing for me is I re remember particularly one summer and there were a lot of like things on the news and there was like not good stuff. And I was thinking, but you don't see the other side. You don't see the kids who are like playing on the streets and you don't see the neighbors who are looking out for each other and the barbecues and, and going to the park and, and, and hanging out by the corner store and meeting your friends and all of that stuff. And that's what I wanted to focus on. So that's why I knew I wanted it to be this you know, 12 year old black girl on the South side of Chicago. Um, I wanted it to be full of adventure um, and I wanted to focus on kind of all of these kind of fantasy elements that I grew up really loving, but not necessarily seeing myself being a part of in most of the books I read. So I wanted that, you know, the, the paranormal part, the ghost, the, 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 the superpowers, the magic. Um, and I wanted to infuse all of that. Um, in the story. And I wanted her not to be a sidekick. I wanted her to be the center of the story and, and to be the driving force of the story. Um, so that's where I kind of initially got the ideal. Um, and I knew it was going to be three books from the beginning. Um, as you said, um, I know you guys were so excited about it early on and that just like fueled me. But like when I first started writing this, I'm like, this is an arc. This is huge. This is, <laughs> this is more than one book because I knew um, that you know i wanted her to go on the journey i wanted her to grow through the series so she starts off you know maya doesn't know anything about magic she doesn't know about her, her family's history the orishas and celestials and what that means um and then she goes from kind of not knowing to what we see a lot in middle grades that self-discovery and finding kind of your own power for within and that doesn't necessarily even mean magic it's just being brave um and facing situations that might be a little bit scary um, so she kind of goes from not knowing much about that or anything about it to, you know, coming into her own, um, you know, protecting her friends, her family and her neighborhood and coming together um, to, to make sure that they, you know, they not only kind of protect each other, but save the whole world. So it becomes more like I'm protecting my family, my neighborhood to this whole huge arc of I am saving the whole world from the dark bringers and the Lord of Shadows. So I felt like those were middle grade themes. So I think when I first started, I'm like this is this is definitely for a middle grade audience. Great. What were some of those um, stories and fantasies that um, you know, that you were reading as a kid or that you love and yeah. kind of inspired you. Yeah. Um, and I read up a lot as a kid, but some of the ones that I remember the most that were kind of influencing, you know, like me and making me excited. I read the, the Goosebumps series, Spear Streets. I liked a lot of the scary stuff. I think that'll be a theme. 
Um, I really liked um, the last, uh, the last vampire. I don't, mm -hmm. a lot of people don't know that one, um, and I liked just things that were engaging on the fantasy side. Like I didn't read a lot of realism or kind of contemporary books. Um, other things probably was a little bit reading up the Lord of the Rings, <laughs> which is probably reading up a little bit. And I also read a lot of sci-fi, which is why Maya has this kind of quirky blend of um, fantasy, but then there's like the little sci-fi touches in there because her best friend Frankie is into science and she's always kind of bringing up her like her scientific theories and such. Um, so like TV wise, I was really into like the Star Treks. <laughs> um, I still am like they're on my favorites right now to rewatch later. You know how we always go back to the things yes. we love the most. Um, Star Wars and all of that stuff. So I was very into, you know, all of that. Um, on the superhero side, I was into like the X-Men, Spider-Man, ba Batman, just all of the fun things that most kids um, like, I think. And I wanted to, I wanted to draw from that. Like I wanted this ideal, because in this story, you know, there's also a comic book, right? It's a fictional one, it's mm -hmm. Oria, um, based on, you know, Orisha. And, but it was, and for me, wanting to see more of these superhero heroes and characters that look like Maya so that she can have someone to look up to the way I hope that kids can, you know, see Maya and, and look up to, you know, her as well. So a lot of my childhood was definitely fantasy. I lived in a fantasy world. Not that that's surprising because most of those <laughs> authors do. But yeah, I, I consumed a lot of fantasy and sci-fi. <laughs> well, I think, you know, these books are such a nice balance of Maya and her friends and family feeling like very real contemporary people that you might know. And then, you know, your blend of that fantastical element, I think that's part of what makes it work so well. You feel like Maya is a kid you could know, or maybe even you could be. Um, so, you know, I loved that part of it. Um, but, you know, Maya and then her friends, Eli and Frankie, uh, to me, they really personify what true friendship really means. So I was curious if those relationships and their relationship um, were inspired by anybody in your own life, or was it just something you felt like had to be in this book um, to ha give Maya that sort of foundation and support in all the crazy activities that <laughs> end up happening to all of them? They do go through a lot of really weird, crazy things. Um, so Maya and her friends are definitely inspired by my childhood relationships. So it's a little bit like most writers. We take a little piece of this person or that person and we, you know, hodgepodge them together and make, you know, these characters. But what I really wanted and had seen in kind of my own childhood is that there's always that your close friends who kind of compliment you. Um, they're not necessarily the same personality and think the same way. And I think that was important to the story um, because oftentimes we don't want like this kind of a single thought and single process of mind or narrative. So I wanted to make sure that um, Frankie and Eli balance Maya, have very different ways of kind of looking at what's happening to the world. Um, and that was done intentionally too, so that kids can kind of see, and adults too who read the book can kind of see like, hey, it's not always that we think alike. We offer each other solutions um, and opinions that help us kind of together come up with like the answer. So Maya cannot save the day without her friends. Like they are offering a piece of the puzzle to kind of help her get through the story. Um, and they're very different. So Maya's, you know, she's into the superheroes. Eli's into like the paranormal and ghosts. Um, and then Frankie's into like kind of science. So they're very different. You know, they're pretty extreme, but it kind of works because they all offer something different um, to the situation as they kind of go through their challenges, um, you know, to save the day. And I think that's kind of important for kids to see, like, it's OK to be different. It's OK to, um, you know, offer your opinion. You know, you're not always right. Maya's not always right. Sometimes she's a little brash and she's like <laughs> making these uh, decisions that her friends kind of like reel her back a little bit. Um, but I think it's important for kids to kind of see that it's it's okay to not always agree and okay to kind of formulate your own opinion and also to listen to others. Yeah. No, I love the three of them because they do complement each other and are so different. Um, so I loved seeing that that friendship. Um, 
you know, at the beginning of book two, Maya and the Return of the Godlings, Maya has become a guardian in training and she's working with her dad to stop the Darkbringers and Lord of Shadows from entering the human world and repairing the tears in that um, connection to that world. Um, can you talk a little bit about the relationship between Maya and her father? He's so central to all of this. Yeah. And, um, I loved reading their relationship interaction, yeah. how Maya was trying to help and save him. Um, so I'd love to know a little more about yeah. that. Yeah. So Maya is very close to her father. Um, and it, I think what kind of created their initial bond is that he's a storyteller and he loves to kind of tell these fantastical stories about he saved, you know, like he saved the world or he was in a city on the clouds or, um, or he flew <laughs> from London <laughs> uh, to um, Paris, I think in like a hot air balloon. I can't remember exactly what it was, but all these kind of fantastical stories about how he knew B Bigfoot and all of that. And I think what Maya likes is this ideal that there's more to the world. I mean, she's 12. She's kind of like always been in her neighborhood, but she has these like feelings and thoughts about like what's more out there. And her father, who's kind of traveling in book one, he's always kind of away, kind of gives her a little bit insight into that. And I think that's kind of their initial connection of her kind of loving to listen to his stories and him like loving to tell stories. And there's something to say about that, right? The bond between, you know, a parent and a child. Um, and sometimes it's that one thing and sometimes it's kind of more, but like that's what grows into this kind of bigger relationship. And so by the end of book one, you know, all the things that happen, I won't spoil it, but by the, you know, the end of it, she becomes a guardian uh, of the veil in training and her father's guardian of the veil. So that actually creates even more of a bond because now they're doing the same job. She's in training. She's still got to go to school. Right. She's got her after school tutoring that still has to happen. Um, but she she realizes that there's kind of more to the world and like she has an important role to protect the world. Um, and I think that creates even more of a bond with her father kind of knowing that. And, you know, book two things go bad again, which is, you know, typical. And, you know, she's, you know, she's, she has to kind of grow. So it's not just this guardian in the veil, but like, oh, I need to think about the serious side of things. Cause you know, the book has some darker themes in it and, you know, people going missing or, you know, you know, a, a Lord of Shadows wanting to destroy the world. That's kind of dark. Um, and it's her parents, you know, that get her through that, like the strength of her father, but also her mom mm -hmm. um, that kind of gets her through kind of understanding that the world isn't always nice and it's, it's not always kind, but we can create those spaces of kindness and we can create that community and we can kind of work together to, to you know, make things better. And her father is kind of the catalyst for understanding that. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, I love reading both about our our characters, Maya, her dad, her friends, and then the characters um, within that world of the dark, the Lord of Shadows, the dark bringers. Um, were there things about our world you wanted to mirror in that world? And, you know, I'm thinking about how the dark bringers have different skin tones and features. Um, when in a lot of fantasies, sometimes these sorts of characters are sort of carbon copies of each other. Mm -hmm. And you just know, like, that's the evil one. And they all look the same. And they all act the same. And they're mm -hmm. all, you know, who we're supposed to be fighting against. Um, you know, can you talk about making some of those choices when you're developing this, this other world? Because it's so rich. Um, you do such a great job of the world building. So yeah, I'd love to know more about yeah. this is. Mm -hmm. So the the first thing that I thought about when I wanted to create the, the bad characters is that there is this ideal of good and evil and light and dark. So oftentimes when we think dark, you know, in the past, it's been like, well, dark is bad, dark is scary, dark is the unknown, dark is the other. Um, so that's why I named it the dark. Um, and I wanted to create characters that with the dark bringers that you automatically, these are characters that if we were looking at them, if we had our you know bias lens on, we would say that these characters must be bad. They have horns, they have barbed tails, they're they you know, some of them are blue, you know, like dark blue and, and like you know, have like jagged teeth and all of that stuff. So like they must be horrible people. 
But then I wanted to kind of present that as a start. But then as Maya kind of goes through the story across three books, I mean, she'll discover like anything, you can't kind of judge one people by kind of what you see or what you hear. You've got to kind of go through the experience and kind of judge people on the individual level. Um, and so I did that on purpose. It's like creating these creatures that, oh, well, they have to all be horrible, you know, but no, are they all horrible? Like, but that's for the reader to decide based on the actions of the characters. And I think that is important for kids to kind of understand, like, we don't necessarily judge people by how they look, like you judge people by their actions. And that's something that Maya discovers and, and, and may, you know, her mind sh uh, shifts a little bit as she goes through the dark um, in book one. And then in book two, she sees even more of the dark. Um, and then it was kind of fun to, to create the cities and kind of the atmosphere. There's a lot of like dangerous stuff in the, in, in the dark. There's like shadows that try to eat them in the, in the forest. And <laughs> um, but then Maya finds out that some of the things that are wrong and not, you know, that are dangerous in the dark um, is partially the fault of the celestials and even her father. And having to come to terms with, hey, my dad, I love him so much, he's, he's perfect, but wait, maybe he's not. So I'm not perfect either. And she makes mistakes. And I think she comes to that realization that we're none of us are perfect, but how do we you know, account for and how do we try to correct you know, the mistakes that we made? How do we try to do better for the future? And so that's something that she's going through. And the world building actually speaks you know, to that. Um, because it, it, you know, it's it's brought up a couple of times how the dark world was created and some of the challenges and dangers here um, because of the creation of the veil. Um, so that was kind of nice to play upon that um, a little bit. Well, and you know, it's all through this fantasy lens, but those are things that kids are discovering for themselves at that age too. That you know, you can't judge a book by its cover, so to speak, mm -hmm. and that you know, things are much more complicated than you would, you know, imagine. So um, it's a great sort of piece of self-discovery that Maya is going through uh, throughout this as well. Um, the final book in the trilogy, Maya and the Lord of Shadows, is coming mm -hmm. next fall, fall 2022. Is there anything you can tell us about what's next for Maya without giving too much away? <laughs> Yeah, I will say I saw an early draft of the cover and it is gorgeous. I love it so much. So, and the covers for the series have been amazing. I'm, they have. Yeah, I, I was gonna like I pull have them up right here. Yeah, I was gonna pull them up too. Yeah, I love them. And the For third one is great. Um, so Maya's gone through a lot in book one and book two, and then Maya and the Lord of Shadows will be kind of coming to full terms of all the things that have been happening. We know since book one, the Lord of Shadows has been trying to escape the dark so that he can wreak havoc on the human world. He wants revenge against everyone, against the celestials, the godlings, um, the humans. Um, and so we're really kind of coming to terms with that. And what <laughs> what happens in the end of book two kind of really sets the foundation for um, the challenges that Maya and her friends are going to have in book three. And there's just going to be some more revelations on kind of what the world will become now that things are changing. Let's just say she's not going to be able to to just go back to school and go to math tutoring and think everything's going to be perfect like there's just a lot of things that are, are going to be happening um that changes um and then she's got there's some new people there and i you know i won't say where what capacity but there's some new friends involved that um add some interesting twists to the story i think awesome um you know ultimately is there anything that you want young readers to get from reading your books, from reading Maya and this whole Yeah, trend. I think it kind of comes back to the importance for me is that theme of family, friendships, and community and understanding um, that, you know, we are individuals, but we are also a part of a bigger picture and to always work towards a greater good, which Maya and her friends do, but understand that we're not perfect and we're going to make mistakes. And it's about figuring out how to be better people as we grow and as we learn. 
Um, and, and just in general, just having fun. Cause again, like kids, like we, we have these themes in these books and we want them to kind of learn from them, but we also want kids to just kind of enjoy, like enjoy it while, while you're young, <laughs> as they say, but like there's, there's part of that. That's really fun of, cause the books are pretty fast paced and they're, that's on purpose. Cause it's like, let's just, let's also have fun as we learn. So I just want people to, and kids to kind of just know, you know, we're part of a bigger world and the importance of contributing to that in a positive way. Well, I think that definitely comes across and these books could not be more of a fun read, both as an adult and from the kids that I've talked to and shared them with. So thank you, Rena, for writing them and sharing them with us. Thank you for being here today and talking a little bit more about Maya and the series. And I hope everybody goes out. And if you have not read book one, yeah. please go get that. And then book two is just brand new <laughs> and out right now. Um, and then more Maya to come next fall. Um, thank you, Rena. Thank you for being here with Thanks us. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>